Hi, my name is Cam Gabriel. I am a doctoral student at the Schubert School of Music in Rice University. And today I would like to talk a little bit about French composers and arts. This video will feature musical performances by my colleagues and friends at the Schubert School of Music. Jean-Henri d'Anglebert was the Baroque composer, harpsichordist and organist, viewed as one of the most prominent keyboard composers of the 17th century. His career culminated with his appointment as a harpsichordist at the court of King Louis XIV. His musical style is characterized by an elaborate use of counterpoint and ornaments. Alongside d'Anglebert, I would like to introduce you to a contemporary of his, the Baroque painter Charles Lebrun, who also worked at the court of Louis XIV. Actually, the king considered him as the greatest French artist of all time. Charles Lebrun was the creator of many paintings, sculptures, and decorations commissioned by the French government under Louis XIV. He notably decorated the Palace of Versailles. Now that we have some visual representation of the art at the time in France, I would like to go back to Danglebert and talk about his Pièce de Clavecin. Pièce de Clavecin is a set published in 1689 for harpsichord. Um, it's considered as his principal work and comprises four suites, which consist of a succession of dance movements, usually preceded by a prelude. At the time, almost all French composers included table of ornaments in their printed editions to illustrate the manner of playing. Now, d'Anglebert included a very thorough table of ornaments, which is a very valuable source for understanding the 17th century French style, and it serves also as the basis for many later tables. Now, let's give a listen to the prelude from his suite in D minor, part of Pièce de Clavecin.
Camille Saint-Saëns was a French composer, organist, conductor, and pianist of the Romantic period. Romantic composers sought to create music that was individualistic, emotional, dramatic, and often programmatic, which is the attempt to render extra musical narrative musically. He is also one of the pioneers of the symphony poem genre in France, which was a one-movement piece of orchestral music popularized by Hungarian composer Franz Liszt. Camille Saint-Saëns was a child prodigy and made his concert debut age 10. He also was an amateur poet, and for him, studying French language in depth was very important in order to write songs effectively. This fondness for words might explain the extent of his repertoire for voice. He composed over 100 songs, 60 sacred vocal works, and 12 operas. Before talking and listening to one of his pieces, I would like to introduce you to a French painter, also part of the Romantic movement. Eugène Delacroix was regarded as the leader of the French Romantic school. He emphasized on color and movement with expressive brushstrokes rather than clarity of outline to convey dramatic and romantic feelings. It is to note that Romanticism started earlier in the visual arts than it did in music, so we're talking about the end of 18th century, why in music romanticism is usually associated with the 19th century and very early 20th century. The 1830 painting La Liberté Guidant le Peuple, Liberty Leading the People, is arguably one of his most famous works. The center figure of the painting is a woman brandishing the French flag. She's known as Marianne, an allegorical goddess figure personifying liberty, equality, fraternity, who has also been the national personification of the French Republic since the French Revolution of 1789. She is wearing a Frisian cap, which is yet another symbol of liberty since the French Revolution. Now let's go back to Camille Saint-Saëns. Uh, we're going to listen to his Tarantelle in A minor for flute, clarinet and piano, opus 6. It was composed in 1857, when Saint-Saëns was 22 years old and relatively unknown. The opera composer Rossini helped Saint-Saëns' Tarantelle win universal acclaim by having the piece performed during one of his Parisian dinner parties. He pretended it to be one of his own composition, and after dinner, when the guests congratulated him uh, on the piece, he revealed that the music was actually composed by the young Saint-Saëns. The Tarantelle, which is French for the Italian word Tarantella, is a lively Italian dance which, according to popular legend, was meant to emulate the frenzied reaction to the bite of a tarantula spider. But in reality, the term Tarantella takes its origin from the city of Taranto in Italy. It was a popular type of concert piece in the 19th century due to its wild energy. Thank you. 
Gabriel Fauré, 
was a French composer, organist, pianist, and teacher. He was a central figure in 19th and 20th century French music, and his musical style influenced many 20th century composers. He studied piano with Camille Saint-Saëns, among others, and we teach prominent musicians such as Maurice Ravel and Nadia Boulanger. His works created a bridge between the Romantic period of the 19th century and the modernism of the 20th century. Fauré excelled not only as a songwriter, totaling more than 100 songs, but also as a composer of chamber music. Gabriel Fauré was a fervent admirer of poet Paul Verlaine, and he actually set many of his poems in music, such as the Song Cycles, Cinq Mélodies de Venise, and La Bonne Chanson. Verlaine was associated with the Symbolist art movement, which reacted against naturalism and realism by seeking to represent absolute truths symbolically through language and metaphorical images. One of the poems for a set into music is Mandoline, which is drawn from Verlaine's collection of poems, Fête Galante. Mandoline. Les donneurs de sérénades et les belles écouteuses échangent des propos fades sous les ramures chanteuses. C'est Tircis et c'est Aminte, et c'est l'éternel qui tendre, et c'est Damis qui pour mainte cruelle fait mainte vers tendre. Leurs courtes vestes de soie, leurs longues robes à queue, leur élégance, leur joie et leurs molles ombres bleues. Tourbillonnent dans l'extase d'une lune rose et grise et la mandoline jase parmi les frissons de brise. Fauré retired as director of the Paris Conservatory in 1920, which gave him more time to compose. We're about to listen to his piano trio in D minor, opus 120, which is one of his very last works written when Fauré was 78, and most likely completely deaf.
Claude Debussy is seen as one of the most influential composers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He developed his own style of composition using harmony and sound as a coloring device to express moods and impressions. And as such, his music is often labeled as impressionist, a term first used in the late 19th century to describe a new style in French painting found in works by Monet, Pissarro, Renoir, and others, in which the emphasis of the painting is in the overall impression rather than the clarity of detail. Impressionism takes its name from Monet's painting Impression Soleil Levant. This painting depicts a port at sunrise in a hazy manner which strayed from the traditional landscape painting and idealized beauty prevailing at the time. Debussy actually objected to the use of the word impressionism for his music and saw himself more as a symbolist, which is another late 19th century art movement originating in poetry which seeks to represent absolute truth symbolically as a reaction against realism. Now we're going to listen to two pieces by Debussy. The first one is his Prélude à l'après-midi d'un phone, known in English as Prelude to the Afternoon of a Phone. It is a symphonic poem for orchestra composed in 1894. It's inspired by the poem L'après-midi d'un phone by Stéphane Mallarmé, which is a monologue in which a phone is evoking the nymphs and the nature surrounding him in a succession of poetic images.
Next, we will listen to Debussy's piece La Plus Que Lente, which is originally a valse for solo piano written in 1910. There are several transcriptions available of the piece. Actually, Debussy wrote one for small orchestra. The version we are going to listen to is written for clarinet and piano. Now, the piece's title generally translates in English to the even slower waltz. But despite the title, the piece was not meant to be played slowly. In this context, slow is a sarcastic reference to the popular genre, valse lente, that Debussy attempted to emulate in his piece. Debussy marked the score with the indication Morto rubato con morbidezza, which encourages a flexible tempo.
Maurice Ravel was a French composer, pianist, and conductor, often compared with Claude Debussy because of his use of elements of Impressionism in his music. However, Ravel possesses a singular musical style which blends elements of modernism, neoclassicism, Spanish folk music, as well as jazz and blues in his later works. During his formative years at the Paris Conservatory, his unconventional musical ideas displeased some of the more conservative faculty members. Another anti-academic artist who preceded Ravel and is regarded as one of the most influential French painters is a 19th century modernist painter, Edouard Manet, who marked the transition from realism to impressionism. He also started to focus on images of everyday life, such as scenes in cafe, boudoir, and on streets. The painting Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, from 1863, is a testimony to Manet's refusal to conform to convention and his initiation of a new freedom from traditional subjects and modes of representation. It can even perhaps be considered as the departure point for modern art. Let's go back to Maurice Ravel, and we're going to listen to his string quartet written in 1903 when he was 28 years old. The piece is dedicated to his teacher Gabriel Fauré, and the structure is modeled on Debussy's string quartet written a decade earlier. The string quartet would eventually be regarded as his first masterpiece.
I decided to include Igor Stravinsky to this video, even though he was a Russian-born composer, because he actually became a French citizen in 1934, and also later an American citizen in 1945. During his life in France between 1920 to 1939, Stravinsky became one of the leading neoclassical composers. Neoclassicism in music refers to a trend during the interwar period in which composers went back to clarity and emotional restraint of the classical and baroque periods as a reaction to the highly emotional music of the late Romanticism. Stravinsky was friends with the Spanish painter Pablo Picasso, who spent most of his adult life in France. Their friendship began just before the end of World War I in 1917, and they exchanged small pieces of art by mail. Stravinsky wrote a sketch of clarinet music for Picasso on a hotel telegram, drawing from elements of Picasso's Cubism style in a musical context, to which then the painter uh, Picasso responded with three drawings of Stravinsky. This is one of them. The two artists collaborated in pieces such as Ragtime in 1919 and the ballet Pulcinella in 1920, which was commissioned by Sergei Diaghilev, impresario of the Ballet Russe, for which Picasso designed original costumes and sets. The drawings you can see right now were made by Picasso for the cover score of Stravinsky's Ragtime. Now we're going to listen to Stravinsky's concerto in E-flat called Dumbarton Oaks. It is heavily inspired by Johann Sebastian Bach's Brandenburg Concertos. The concerto in E-flat was finished in 1938 and was the last work Stravinsky completed in Europe before moving to the US.
Francis Poulenc was a French composer and pianist of the 20th century. He served briefly as a soldier during the Second World War before being demobilized from the army. During the Nazi rule, his music featured anti-German elements. For instance, his cantata, Figure Humaine, written in 1943 for an accompanied double choir, said eight poems by poet Paul Éluard, who was a prominent member of the French resistance. Liberté is the title of the song concluding the cantata as a hymn for liberty. It is based on Liberté, a poem written in 1942 by Paul Éluard. It is made of 24 quatrains in which Éluard names places on which he would write the word Liberté. Liberté Sur mes cahiers d'écoliers, sur mon pupitre et les arbres, sur le sable de neige, j'écris ton nom. Sur les pages lues, sur toutes les pages blanches, pierre sans papier ou cendre, j'écris ton nom. Sur les images dorées, sur les armes de guerriers, sur la couronne des rois, j'écris ton nom. Sur la jungle et le désert, sur les nids, sur les genêts, sur l'écho de mon enfance, j'écris ton nom. Et par le pouvoir d'un mot, je recommence ma vie. Je suis né pour te connaître, pour te nommer Liberté. Francis Poulenc's musical style avoids Debussy's Impressionism and the heavily emotionally charged German Romanticism. He gravitates more towards a carefree tunefulness, lively wit, and naive sentimentality. Francis Poulenc first sketched his cello sonata in 1940 and finished it in 1948. The piece comprised four movements, and you are about to listen to the last two movements. The third movement is called balabile, which means suitable to dance, and it's characterized by its playfulness, while the last movement alternates between serious, playful, and lyrical sections.
Olivier Messiaen was one of the major composers of the 20th century. Messiaen perceived colors when he heard musical chords, which is a phenomenon known as synesthesia. Combinations of these chords were important in his compositional process. He also traveled widely and wrote works inspired by diverse influences, such as Japanese music or the Indonesian gamelan. He found bird songs fascinating, which led him to incorporate bird song transcriptions into his music. You just listened to La Colombe, written in 1928. It is the first movement out of eight from his preludes for piano, which Messiaen composed when he was only 20 years old. Each movement of the work is accompanied by a description consisting mostly of the associated colors. So for La Colombe, which means the dove in English, the description is orange with violet veins. Messiaen described his preludes as a collection of successive states of mind and personal feelings. Emotions of loss and love are found profusely in this music, which was composed after the death of his mother, the poet Cécile Sauvage, in 1927. But it was also dedicated to the pianist Henriette Roger, whom Messiaen was in love with at the time. Messiaen paid tribute to his mother in other compositions as well. In his Trois Mélodies, for instance, the second song is a setting of one of her poems called Le Sourire. Le Sourire Certains mots murmurés par vous est un baiser, intime et prolongé comme un baiser sur l'âme. Ma bouche veut sourire et mon sourire tremble. Thank you for watching my video. I hope you liked it.